doctors, nurses, and hospital staff of Reddit. What are your experiences? Funny, sad, horrible, with people waking from anesthesia? A patient woke up from his wisdom tooth removal begging the doctor to let him be David Bowie. The doctor actually asked how that was supposed to happen, and the answer was that it would be fantastic. He then sang a pitch perfect rendition of Space Oddity in an admirable Bowie impression, pies himself and passed out. Had a patient in for an endoscopy. As a matter of course, we place a speculum, think ball gag, bit a metal ring instead of a ball, in the mouth through which to pass the scope so the patient doesn't bite the scope once they are under. We typically place it right at induction of anesthesia. This patient had the presence of mind to ask us what the safe word was before he lost consciousness as we placed the speculum. One of the rare times the whole aura erupted in laughter. Well at least we know he's prudent. I once had a patient start totally trashing her sister, telling me how she has always been the black sheep of the family, is a scumbag and wants to bang her husband. She's just going off. And sitting in the doorway was the sister, the only one there to support her after surgery. You could tell it was crushing for her. This was probably an hour after the patient left Paku, conscious but still pretty whacked out. Yikes. I had a patient pet an invisible kitty that was named after me. The next day, was completely with it and was wondering what happened to that kitty. I think the patient wanted you to sit in their lap so they could pet you. I had an 8 year old kid in the or say you mother cause right before she fell asleep. I did this, well, I freaking hate you guys, it's because the sensations are weird and scary as you go under. I'm an anesthesia student currently doing my clinical rotations and I had an old guy wake up and the first thing he asked was do I still have my balls and I told him yep, both of them and he said both, or you guys are great. I like to imagine he only had one ball and was thrilled to hear that you gave him a new one. Not a hospital staff but my great grandfather had surgery one time and I was in the room when he woke up. He was a World War II veteran and was convinced that he was in a Nazi POW camp. He recognized me and told me I had to help him escape by killing the guards, nurses, because he knew I knew how to kill people. I was 16, obviously a train killer. When the nurse came in he was calm and kept motioning with his head at her to me and finally looked at me and said kill her. Now, she always came back with another male nurse after that. <laughs> nurse here, this really big, hairy Turkish guy, whom I've never met before, told me how much he loved me and that he wanted to kiss me. I'm male BTW. He wanted to kiss you. <laughs> told to me by my wife confirmed by the nurse. I was in bed hospital room, waiting for surgery, they already gave me meds to calm me but they knocked me out. Two nurses come in to move me to a gurney but they were small and I'm big they can't move me over. My wife came over and poked me in the ribs saying you're snoring roll over, and I rolled right onto the gurney. Your wife is brilliant. I was the patient, but I had to get 5 teeth pulled. The nurse was helping my mom shuffle me to the car. I turned to thank her, but couldn't get my mouth to work, so I bowed and doffed an imaginary cap. I'm anesthesia. Went straight from the air to surgery to put a plate in my badly broken arm, so I hadn't been on a ward ETC prior to the operation. Came out of surgery and recovery and was being pushed in a hospital bed to a ward. We turned into a ward and it was full of elderly people. I was in my early 20s. I turned to the hospital porter pushing me and shouted sorry we seem to have taken a wrong turn. We're in the morgue. Umfeo. I hope they didn't hear you. My first memory when waking up from shoulder surgery was a somewhat panicked nurse rummaging through the blankets at the bottom of my bed repeatedly muttering where are his legs. Where are his legs? I always cross my legs when I sit lay down and apparently I must have done this as I was initially coming off the anesthesia. It freaked me out for a second, but then I processed what was going on. The nurse seemed relieved when I mumbled there right here and nearly kicked her in the face when I extended my legs. What an odd thing to be saying out loud. Patient checking in. I was 18 and just had my appendix removed. My mum was at my bedside. I wake up and more pain from the operation than the appendicitis and even worse my balls are itchy. I'm wearing a hospital gown and I'm out of it so I put my hand on my stomach and run it down to my skin so I can scratch my balls. Obviously not wearing underwear and my hand runs down an excess of smooth skin. 
Then suddenly I'm touching my goods. I rummage around and come to the conclusion that someone has shaved my pubes. No one told me this would happen. I was livid. It's the hype of visiting hours and I'm shouting in my broad Scottish accent AWW mum. They've shaved my pubes. I'm no happy about this I want my pubes back. That's no right. No one told me about this. Get my pubes. My mother was mortified and she's trying to get me to calm down while laughing and trying avoid a scene. They grew back in about 4 weeks so it was no biggie but at the time it was a serious issue. When I got my wisdom teeth out, I apparently called my Middle Eastern surgeon a sly Arabian tooth thief after coming to. That was fun to learn about when I regained mental clarity. So I'm an attack, and we have this regular that comes in all the time. She's an old black lady who has a lot of health issues, including dementia. This time, I'm actually not entirely sure why she was coming in, but whatever it was, she needed to be intubated. So we sedated her, put the tube in and did what we needed. When everything was finished, we called Ems to pick her up and take her back home. When they arrived, the nurse and I went in to prep her to leave. The lady is just starting to wake up from sedation. So, with the EMT standing in the room, we take out her Foley catheter. Then, she queefs. The nurse and I smirk at each other, but this is fairly common and not the funny part. The funny part is that the noise seemed to surprise her, and apparently remind her what was going on. Because she gasps and then looks over to the EMTs and says in an attempt at a sexy voice, You boys ever seen a black coochie before? Everyone in the room had to take a second to attempt to regain composure, but the EMTs ended up having to leave the room and the nurses crouching on the ground trying not to die. I, since I still have the foley in my hands, don't have this freedom, and I'm forced to try to keep my sides from launching into orbit. It's since become a running joke around the air. No way. This literally happened to me. I was the paramedic taking her home lol. When my husband woke up from having his wisdom teeth surgically removed his nurse was a rather large lady. Like 350 plus. He looked her dead in the eyes and said you're too beautiful to be a nurse. You should have been a model. Why don't you just come home with me and my wife? Yes he was propositioning a three way with a 50 year old 350 pound nurse. Most awkward moment of my life. How nice that he wanted to include you though. I got my wisdom teeth out last month and was curiously subdued. My wife informed me, at least at the office. She loaded me up in the car and away we went. About halfway home, she called my mother to let her know that the surgery went well and I remained stonily quiet. After she got off the phone, I demanded that my wife call my mother back. When she did so I told her, Mom, you have lots of dogs, and they need lots of love. Then I made the cut the call motion to my wife. When we arrived home, I was brought up short by my wife's pillowcase, which has a sloth on it. I asked out loud honey, there's a frickin sloth in here. How did we catch one? They're so fast. Then she tried to take my jeans off of me so I could go to sleep and I yelled whoa they're missy when she grabbed for the fly. All in all, a pretty great morning. They're so fast lol. When I was 14 I had eye surgery. Coming out of anesthesia the nurses asked me if I could remember my name. I slurred. My name is Worcestershire Sauce. No, wait, that's not a cool name. My name is Shark. I can't even pronounce Worcestershire completely sober. Impressive. Wish I was earlier to this one. My fiancé recently had her tonsils removed. Her mother and I were there when she woke up. After a few minutes she told her mother now that I've got my tonsils out. I can fit more of his willy in my mouth. It was awkward. I am so glad I made it down to this one. I had surgery on my wrist and came out of anesthesia screaming my balls hurt. The doctor came in and asked what was wrong. I said my balls hurt. He replied dude you had wrist surgery. No one touched your balls. Two stories. One, I had a lady in her 70s who drank martinis and took Xanax all day, every day, so she had such a strong tolerance to the sedation I was giving her that she just totally stopped breathing while still awake. I had to say ma'am, I'm going to have to bag you now, and she mouthed a K and I put the ambu bag on her face and force breathed for her until she got her respiratory effort back. 2. I was in helping with a heart procedure and the patient went into complete heart block and his heart stopped beating. 
I hop up to the table and start chest compressions while they are hurriedly trying to put in a temporary pacing wire. I had an arterial pressure waveform on the monitor, so I could see exactly how hard to do the compressions and the man never lost consciousness. So I'm doing chest compressions on a dude while he looks right at my face the whole time. So it was like press press sorry press press sorry for about 2 minutes until the pacing wire was in place. That's amazing. Both stories. I was the patient. I'd had all 4 wisdom teeth out at once. And I woke up earlier than expected in recovery. Early enough that they hadn't taken out the wadding at the back of my mouth meant to absorb the blood. So I woke up. Immediately felt like I was choking. And panicked. I leapt off the bed. And a bunch of nurses came to restrain me. Still out of it. I fought them and definitely gave one of them a good punch before they got me back on the bed. I passed out again straight away. Still feel bad about it. Poor nurse. Came out of an aesthetic and the lead nurse decides it's time to tell me all about post-op care. She says, now this is going to be a pain in the ass. And I said, if that's the case, then you guys performed the wrong procedure it was a nose operation. The assistant nurse started laughing. Lead nurse not so amused. Not a doc or nurse. When I got my wisdom teeth out, they strapped my arm down for the IV anesthetic. Apparently, before passing out, I looked up at the white-haired German dentist and said in my best Connery, Goldfinger, do you expect me to talk? The dentist didn't reply, but he did tell me after surgery that it was one of the funniest things anyone asked him in a haze. No mister. Bond, I expect you to sleep. Not a doctor. A friend was in a car crash. Pretty bad he was in a coma for two months. He had a female doctor. For two months until he came out of his coma every time his doctor was checking on he would reach up and grab her breast. Guessing he heard her voice. When we told him about he did not believe us. So he asked her and she confirmed it. Said she never stopped him because it seemed to keep him calm. The doctor deserves a medal. I was the patient but I think this qualifies. Colonoscopy. In this big lounge chair still half asleep in recovery. I half roll over and let rip the biggest fart in history. The devil himself created this one. I open half an eye at a nurse. Ask was that me. Jew on the ground she nods and I go back to sleep. You have to fart after the colonoscopy or they don't let you go home. I was working in the pediatric and sedating a skater kid 14 or 15. We are talking more a wannabe suburban kid rather than a punk. Kinda kid that obviously joined a frat in college. His mom is there in the room as he starts waking up once we had his wrist set and in the cast. His mom is typical well to do suburban mom who spends lots of time at yoga and PTA meetings that is. Not trashy at all and family was likely from a well to do part of town. My buddy who is fairly hairy on his arms etc reached across his upper chest to grab an IV line. Kid was half asleep, raised his head up with his eyes still closed and licked my buddy's arm with this exaggerated lick like it was an ice cream cone. Kid flops his head back onto the pillow and his mom just looks mortified in the 2-3 seconds that pass before he slurs out man. I sure do love to lick some pee. His mom immediately turned bright red and walked out of the room and we all busted out laughing except the guy who got licked. The adoc was this young petite girl and she said she peed herself a little she was laughing so hard. For months we would give that guy lick motions in the air when we passed him in the hall and putting rolling stone stickers on his locker etc. I still give him crap about that from time to time. My favorite is to catch him chatting or something standing at the desk and to lean over and sniff his forearm and ask if he has been fishing. Not a nurse but I have a good one. It's been 15 years and I'm still horrified when I think about it. I have to preface this story by saying that I have a super conservative, girl next door type of personality. I am shy, somewhat of an introvert, and most definitely never want to be the center of attention on purpose. I went in for a colonoscopy with a yum yum juice that made me forget everything that happened, although I vaguely remember talking and hearing laughter. When I woke up, people were smirking and glancing at each other, trying to suppress their laughter. I asked if something happened and the staff reassured me that everything was good. 
So when the doctor came in to talk to me before I was released, I asked him if something funny had happened. He reassured me that I had a very normal procedure and then told me that sometimes the medication caused people to lower their inhibitions, but that the effect wore off very quickly, as does the medication. I asked him what he meant by lowering their inhibitions and he paused again and reassured me that it happens to a lot of people. So yeah, I spent my entire colonoscopy talking dirty to my doctor and his tools. I never went back to that doctor again. TL. DR. Yum yum juice made me say dirty things to the doctor. Changed doctors and considered moving out of state due to my humiliation. Edit. Because grammar. Doctors of Reddit. What are some of your anti-vax parent stories? I had a kid come in that was super sick. 3 years old and in septic shock. He had the flu and another compounded viral infection. Or maybe pertussis. Heart rate was close to 200, respiratory rate in the 50s, blood pressure in the 70s. Kid was so freaking dry that we could barely get IVs into him and I almost had to drill an IO. We dumped a ton of fluids into him, started him on vasopressors and transferred him to the local children's hospital. I had asked the mom if he was vaccinated and she said no. Vaccines have really bad side effects. They'll make you sick. I explained to her that not getting the vaccines had made her kid 10 times sicker than he ever would have been from any mild vaccine reaction. She told me I was a freaking moron and that I obviously have no clue what I'm talking and that's the reason her kid was getting transferred. She also told me that recommending she vaccinate her kids was racist. For anyone not familiar with the jargon, an IO is an intraosseous line. That means the thing goes inside your bone to deliver fluids. When I was a medical student, I had a 5 year old patient who looked and acted like a 2 year old. Failure to thrive. His mother was super super weird. She shaved the sides of his head, somehow like a marine cut, but kept his back hair long. She refused to vaccinate him or even feed him certain foods. Her sister and her husband were trying to get custody of the child because his mother was weird and didn't take care of him properly. I suspect she was paranoid. She would literally fight and call you names if you attempt to suggest to put the kid on a proper hospital diet. She wanted to inspect the food first and make sure he eats only certain things. Long story short the attending calling county and they took the child away from her. Good, holy crap that neglectfulness and frankly abuse would have severely impacted that child later on. As a medical student, I went to see a young child, one yo, in the outpatient clinic before the attending. The child was due for vaccines, and I talked to the parents about getting them on that day. The parents said they had reservations about them, so I talked to them about their reservations. We talked about all of the things they had read on the internet, and walked through each point one by one. One of the benefits of being the medical student is that you have nothing but time. I explained how vaccines are made and how they work. They don't have the mercury preservative they once did. Some vaccines are live but attenuated and others are immunogenic sequences bound to a protein. And why we get so many so early. That's when you're most likely to be affected by these diseases. They were concerned about the effects of so many vaccines at once. This is a common concern. But we challenge your system less with a vaccine than you see walking around in the world every day. And about them making the child sick. Not possible with anything but a live vaccine. And that's why those are attenuated. They are such a small dose that a non-immunocompromised individual should have no problem with them even though you might feel a little sick because we activate your immune system and that's how you feel when that happens. The whole discussion took probably half an hour. And then they decided to go forward with the vaccines. As it turns out, most people are just scared. And who can blame them? With all of the misinformation in the world, it's easy to see how parents get to that point. But they also are human. And when you sit and talk to them like the people that they are, intelligent and able to understand your points, they respond in a positive way. It's one of the moments in medical school that I reflect on frequently, especially when things are tough and I feel like being impatient with people. This is a great story. As a nurse I see quite a few patients who are misinformed or simply haven't been educated on certain things. I was a medical student when this happened. My attending pediatrician gave me a heads up about the parent I was about to see and decided it would be best if he came into the room with me. Four year old kid came in with a horrible cough and difficulty breathing. It was almost sure as heck pertussis aka whooping cough. The kid was coughing so bad he vomited on the exam table. 
He went on to ask about vaccinating her kid and of course she replied no even though her son was dang near coughing up his lung right next to her. I think my attending had seen enough and had enough of her not vaccinating her kid and had the following conversation with the kid's mom. Attending. Mrs. I have to ask you. Do you trust me as your son's doctor? Mom. Of course I do doctor. Attending. Well, there's two problems here that we need to address. One, you either think you are more knowledgeable than me when it comes to medicine, and if that's the case I should no longer be your son's doctor, or you don't trust me as a physician and in that case I shouldn't be your son's doctor, mom, blank stare on face, attending, will you please reconsider giving your son a vaccine, mom, no, my attending obviously treated her kid, but after this whole ordeal resolved he fired her and her son as a patient and referred them to another pediatrician. He had enough of her crap. I respected the heck out of him after he pulled this move. We had a 14 year old female come in for abdominal pain one time. She weighed 80 pounds. Looked sickly. Her mother refused to let her eat anything but a handful of things. Nothing with very much protein at all. She literally had a binder full of articles about how horrible vaccines are. All the bad things they put in food these days. Etc. She had completely brainwashed this kid so the kid believed it too. Her labs showed malnutrition. Her teeth were horrible. Just a sad case all around. Curious if the mother was on the same diet. Bet not. When I was a med student, I had a parent who wanted to do a delayed vaccination schedule. Basically it means that you get all the same vaccinations but you pointlessly and foolishly do it over a longer time period. The mom had read a book promoting this practice that was unfortunately written by an MD. My pediatric attending had zero chill. Is that the book written by Dr. Question Mark? Yes. Well, then you should know that I was in the same medical school class as doctor but I got much better scores than he did. Dang. That's freaking savage. I would have loved to see it. <laughs> Nearly qualified pharmacist here. So obligatory not a doctor. Our pharmacy offers travel vaccines for people going away to countries with a high likelihood of severe tropical disease. Star parenting goes to the parents who got themselves vaccinated for rabies, but not their two primary school age, elementary, for non-Brits, children. Med school student here. I was getting my hair cut and I was talking to the barber about how more people should get the new meningitis B vaccine since I know a person who got meningitis B and almost died. The desk lady went off about how vaccines are dangerous, and pretty much every single anti-vax talking point. I explained the actual facts behind vaccines and said that I'm studying medicine. I think I might know what I'm talking about and then she went off about professors not knowing what they are talking about and that they just teach what they are told to teach so that we can all be brainwashed into supporting the big pharmaceutical companies and that my proof were all fabricated by them. In medical school I saw a kiddo whose parents refused vaccines and so when they were given the vaccine refusal form to sign. This form essentially said that the parents understood that refusing vaccines was against medical advice, that their kiddo could get sick from all those preventable diseases, and that they wouldn't hold the doctor practice liable for any complications that the kiddo may get from said preventable diseases. This mom pulled out a sharpie and blacked out the part about the doctor not being held liable. The parents thought that we'd be cool with them just changing that form just for them and they wanted the doctor to be held liable for their moronic choice. Of course this didn't work and they were told to sign the form or they would be discharged from the practice and have to find another. They refused to sign and were told to leave after given a list of other pediatricians in the area. Not a doctor, but a nurse and a vaccine advocate. Once had a public argument with a friend from long ago. He argued that by not vaccinating his kids and risking terrible side effects and possible autism, he was placing no one else at risk. However acknowledged the potential risk to his kids. After attempting to explain the potential risk to others and him failing to understand, I created an analogy which I still use to this day. Imagine if my kids and your kids get into the same car. Both of your kids don't put on seat belts. Therefore, if there is an accident, there is an increased risk that your kids will die and also harm my children in the process. This seemed to click with him and he doesn't share his anti-vac propaganda on social media anymore. Good analogy, it's like not wearing your seatbelt because you're worried you could get trapped in your car after an accident. It's astronomically more likely you will be killed in an accident, 
But hey at least you have avoided the minuscule risk of being trapped in a burning car by your seatbelt. I feel like Family Guy said it best. There's an episode where Lois and Peter kidnap this child to get him to a hospital because the parents believe prayer will heal their kid. So Lois eventually has to confront them and says something like maybe the vaccines and medicines are God's answer to your prayers. So why keep praying if you're going to wipe your ass with his reply? Not directly related to my being a doctor, but a mutual friend of mine and my wife's is a chiropractor and anti-vaxxer, refused to vaccinate her first two kids. I didn't want her or her kids coming anywhere near our place when we had newborns or kids, too because of the risk her unvaccinated kids placed on my partially vaccinated babies. She got all offended saying the usual rubbish like if vaccines work, what do your kids have to fear and your kids are more risk to mine because they'll be shedding viruses doubt her third child was born with cystic fibrosis, which makes them very susceptible to all forms of respiratory and airborne infectious diseases. Suddenly the whole hypocritical family is vaccinated against everything. Well, at least they were able to change to protect their vulnerable child. It could be worse they could have dug in and endangered their youngest. Had a kid come and for generic upper respiratory virus, asked mom if he was vaccinated, as is routine. She said no. When I asked why not, her response was well my boyfriend was vaccinated and he still got meningitis, so they don't even work. I told her that's the same as saying your friend got bruised by a seatbelt in a car accident, so you don't wear them when you drive. Pediatric resident here in the US, our continuity clinic accepts everyone including those kicked out of previous practices for anti-vaccination beliefs, which is a bit frustrating at times. Really, it's a mixed bag for how we can handle these patients. Ostracizing the parents is only going to build further barriers between provider and kid, so that doesn't help. Frankly, what has worked best in my experience is to try to understand where the families are coming from, explicitly asking what their thoughts are on vaccines to let them voice their misunderstandings. Oftentimes, this is the first time they've been allowed to talk about their questions and concerns regarding vaccines with a trained MD that doesn't just belittle them. Most frustratingly, it takes patience and time, assessing where they are regarding change, pre-contemplation, contemplation, etc., helps determine where we are for vaccinating them today, in a month, or in a few months. One thing that I do draw the line on is to make sure that we see these kids more frequently than normal children, as they are at higher risks for illnesses because they are not vaccinated. No room for negotiation on that point. This helps twofold. First, it helps build rapport with the family, but also secondly, if they decide to take a delayed schedule, which is still not ideal, but better than no vaccines, we can eventually catch them up to speed with their vaccinations by frequent return visits. Interestingly, it's always the yoga pants Karen types that are the anti vaxxer or pro-measles as I've been calling them lately, rather than the less educated single moms on welfare or the recent immigrants that speak no English. Ultimately, we're the kids docs and their advocates, and are most effective when we ally with the families, or better put, get the families to ally with us, and do have to be stern after a certain point. It's a mix of being stern, but also compromising to work with families to provide their kids as much and the best, data supported, care as possible. Not a doctor but so, significant other, works with children that have autism. She has one parent that consistently tells her she regrets vaccinating her kid. She then asks questions to my so about which vaccines are the ones that cause autism as if it's a big secret. My so tells her that autism is predetermined before birth and signs just aren't noticeable until around 2 years of age. She still tries to justify her logic with other anti-vax parents stories from FB. My so has two master's degrees towards this field. It blows my mind how they can still argue with overwhelming facts. Fourth year med student reporting in. Had a rotation with a pediatrician where we ended up in the classic encounter with an anti-vaccination parent. This lady was a conspiracy theory magnet. She casually mentioned everything from 9 stroke 11 to chemtrails. Of course she loved the idea of the vaccine conspiracy as well, 
opting to not protect her one year old to stick it to big pharma. I relayed all of this to my attending after my exam. I would see the patient first, gather history and do my exam to present to my attending physician. He got this sort of lazy smirk on his face that screamed watch this. We go back into the exam room and we cover all of the important bits of a well child encounter. Growth charts, behavioral milestones, nutrition, sleep, and then we get to vaccines. She lists approximately 15 reasons why vaccines are more dangerous than the disease they protect against. LOL. In addition to the various evils of the pharmaceutical industry, my attending listens quietly until she's done with her soapbox, about one eternity later, and then interjects with, have you considered the possibility that anti-vaccine propaganda could be an attempt by the Russians or the Chinese to weaken the health of the United States population? In a moment of catastrophic cognitive dissonance, I swear I heard a strange popping noise as her brain misfired. It actually broke her. The allure of the increasingly ridiculous conspiracy theory was just too strong. She ended up agreeing to a modified vaccine schedule. I was flabbergasted. My attending just grinned at me in response. To this day I'm not sure the medical ethics of the situation are totally palatable, but goddamn the result was amazing. Doctors of Reddit, what was a symptom a patient didn't mention that was really important? I had a guy come to the hospital who told me he had seizures every Tuesday like clockwork. This is highly, highly unusual for somebody with a seizure disorder. It wasn't until I asked him about his social history that he told me he's a heavy drinker. I investigated further, and it turns out he binge drinks Thursday, Friday, Saturday every week, then stops cold turkey. He was having withdrawal seizures. This is terrifying. Holy crap. A few months ago a woman, 36 yo, consulted to endocrinology because she was getting fat without a change in her diet and she felt different. Asking more questions she casually mentioned she hadn't had her menstruation for months and that maybe she was menopausic. At 36, we suggested that she might be pregnant and she said it was a stupid idea and that she knew she was not pregnant. We did some analysis and an echography and yep. 35 weeks pregnant, you give birth at around 40. I'm a doctor. Back in school I had a patient who was a drinker, wasn't feeling great and wasn't sleeping well lately. Asked him how the drinking issue was going and he said he lost the taste for it. Alcoholics can quit, they can stop, but they don't just lose the taste for it. Cancer. Black stools. Folks, if you're having black poops FFS mention that sooner rather than later. That lady has been seeing nothing but black for months before she thought to mention anything. We found several gastric ulcers and a hemoglobin level that circled a drain. But also mention if you're taking any iron supplements, or Pepto, they can cause alarmingly dark stools as well, but in that case it's harmless. Medical intern here, had a woman come to her complaining about stomach pain, took her full history did the exam and vitals, she seemed fine, mild fever, made a preliminary diagnosis of gastroenteritis and presented to my doctor. My doctor, who is female, goes to her and asks why she came to her for something so mild. She says because she noticed blood in her stool. The doc comes out and asks me if I asked about her stool. I did. She said it was fine, and I asked specifically about blood. She goes back in and asks the patient why she didn't mention that to me. Her response didn't think it was appropriate to say it to a male intern. Turns out she had ulcerative colitis, needed a colonoscopy and long term medical therapy and possibly surgery. Bro, as someone with Crohn's I talk about my crap like an epic. I have the whole Iliad of the story of my bowels down. I had a patient whose main complaint was a wrist sprain. Asked how he fell and he said he felt lightheaded and fell down the stairs. After about 15 minutes of questions about his heart and other stuff, I ask him if he's had any vomiting. He said he vomits every day. I ask if it's red and he said it's bright red every time. The kicker is this was his usual yearly appointment. Dude was vomiting blood every day and not only did not go to the air, he didn't feel it was worth mentioning at his checkup. I had a patient who needed a small sterile procedure done but had a latex allergy and it was in bright red all over her chart. We used paper charts back then. We had just ran out of latex free sterile gloves. I went in to tell her she needed to come back in a week when we got them back. Then I decided to ask what happened when she came in contact with latex. Her response. I get chlamydia. 
did my Sabina level 1 trauma ED a few years ago as a 4th year med student. Homeless guy with hep, hep, and HIV came in talking about a rash on his shoulder. How it hurt, had been pretty hot out and that was where he was slinging his bag on. Looked okay, figured it for a sweat rash. He was really in there for food, so was going to give him some cream and a sandwich and send him out the door. Was about to leave when I looked at his chief complaint again and it also had testicular pain. So I asked him what was going on with his testicles. Lifts up the gown, and he has a tracking abscess through his scrotal skin and through one of his testicles. It was like a worm burrowing through his balls like it was an apple. Oh it's okay I guess. Ended up calling urology and infectious disease, and the guy ended up leaving against medical advice because we were making him NPO. Without food, in anticipation of surgery. I'm a med student and on my family medicine rotation I was sent to see this woman before the doctor and get a history and physical. She was saying she was having heartburn and just wanted us to give her something to throw up so she will feel better. I thought it was odd and so I went through some more review questions and she said her reflux pain was extending up to the left side of her neck and down her left arm and that she had been sweating for hours. I cut off the interview short there and went to my teaching doctor to tell him everything and what I thought. Got an EKG. Yep, she was having a heart attack. Had to call an ambulance and get her to the air. For your entire career don't forget this case. I'm an adoc. All epigastric pain is an MI until proven otherwise especially in diabetics and women. Had a guy who was sent in because his family was concerned about him. Because he was getting into a lot of physical altercations. Appointment with the patient was normal. He was able to talk himself out of most issues his family stated were occurring. And as we were ending he said he had to pick up his other truck from the shop. I then asked her you own two trucks he replied I own five trucks. The guy was military and only made $60 70k a year. Come to find out he had bipolar disorder and in his manic episodes he would take out a large loan to buy a new truck. He had almost $120k in debt and just trucks. If it wasn't for that last part of him mentioning he was getting his truck, I would have sent him home and probably never known he had a psychiatric issue. I'm a doctor. These stories are from a few years ago when I saw patients. I'm a medical intern, working the ED. Dude comes in with a heart attack. That part's clear as day. Gonna be medically managed. Procedure in the morning. I'm about to queue up some nitro paste. It's a cream you put on skin that helps get blood flow to the heart. As my resident had seen him first and said it was okay. And I went through the contraindications as it was just habit at this point. One of them is recent Viagra use. Patient had said no to recent Viagra to my resident when his wife was there. He said yes to me when I asked when his wife wasn't there. He wasn't using it with his wife. Nitro paste was avoided. Blood pressure stayed okay. Coronary got stented in the morning. Discharged the next day. Pro tip. While you toss the family out to do the rectal exam, ask all the questions they won't answer honestly. <laughs> Saw a patient during follow up for a gynecological cancer. She said she felt great. Exam was normal. She was relieved, but she was so anxious it set off my medical spider sense, so to speak. I decided to push a bit further, which led to this conversation. Me. So you said you felt good? Absolutely nothing else bothering you? Her. Oh. You know. Some small things, nothing having anything to do with this. Me. Well, why don't you tell me anyway? Her. Well, I kind of have this weird lump on my belly, a sweat gland or a greasy nodule or something. Doesn't really bother me, but I might get a dermatologist to have a look at it if it ever needs to be removed. Me. Ah, I see. Could you show it to me? She showed me, and I saw a skin metastasis. Clear as day. Don't know how the story ended because I moved to different service immediately after. But if I had to guess, her life expectancy was probably measured in months. Comma anxious. Comma weird lump. She knew. Admitted a baby my intern year that had transferred to our facility for persistent vomiting following a surgery on a part of the intestinal tract. 
the transferring facility had wanted us to start the baby on a form of intravenous nutrition and offhandedly mentioned some low-grade laboratory abnormalities that they had attributed to the baby just having had surgery. I go into the room in the middle of the night, the first representative of our medical team to meet the family, and in the process of gathering the history, ask the family what color the baby's poop was. The family replied that it was white or gray and had been since birth and that they just thought that was how it should be. Record scratch. Big red flag. We ultimately diagnosed the baby with a rare genetic disorder that required an organ transplant. If you are a middle aged plus gentleman and you have cardiac risk factors, diabetes, overweight etc, and you develop erectile dysfunction you should tell your doctor as there is some evidence that it is an early symptom of heart disease, possibly preceding a heart attack or stroke by 3 to 5 years. Far better to get on statins and blood pressure medication than just ignoring it, or taking Viagra by yourself. You can tell if it's a circulatory cause as opposed to psychological if you stop getting morning erections and have difficult maintaining achieving an erection in your alone fun time. A GP told me this during my primary care rotation. Med student here. I assume she told me this for my learning and not that she thought I was likely an impotent chubby dude. Comma if you are a middle aged plus gentleman and you have cardiac risk factors, diabetes, overweight etc, and you develop erectile dysfunction. A male redditor told me once that high blood pressure was a good thing because higher pressure equals harder wiener. I tried to convince him otherwise, but he wouldn't listen to me. Always. Dang. Unintentional. Weight loss. Takes me from okay not too bad, to oh crap. Such a big red flag. When my grandmother told me about her unintentional weight loss three summers ago I insisted that she see her doctor. I broke down in tears when I got off the phone with her. It turned out to be colorectal cancer and she was gone by Christmas. Not a doctor and not even about me. But this is just too interesting of a story for me not to post it here. So, my dad was a bit of a slow child. Always forgetful. Got bad grades. Needed to have a list of everything important with him all the time to avoid forgetting it. In his 20s he gets an allergy test done for no real particular reason beyond having it recommended to him by his doctor. Turns out he's lactose intolerant. Of course, he tells the doc that the test clearly failed because he's never had a bad reaction to milk in his life. Are you forgetful? Turns out that lactose just makes him forgetful. The doctor he'd visited happened to have done research specifically into that type of lactose intolerance. He cut dairy from his diet and suddenly all the problems went away. To this day I've never met anyone else that even knows that this can happen. I once was rounding on a patient in the morning that had come in for a stroke. I decided to ask some basic review of systems questions just out of habit, and when I asked about changes in vision, he said yes. I probed further and he told me that he was using eye drops for something but that he forgot his eye drops at home 3 days ago when he came to the hospital. For the last 3 days, the vision in his left eye was worsening along with eye pain pressure. When I call his pharmacy to see what drops he was using, as I suspected, they were for glaucoma and he was having worsening vision loss due to untreated glaucoma increasing his intraocular pressure. We got an ophthalmology consult stat. Not a people doctor, but I worked as a vet tech for 3 years. Had a little tiny mini she teased you in horrible health with a nasty attitude to match. You could seriously barely touch the dog and she was very, very sick. The only reason we were able to do anything for her was because she was so small. Owner comes to visit her one afternoon and casually mentions to us that she's deaf. Poor thing was scared out of her mind and did remarkably better once we learned to let her know we were there before touching her. Former tech here, and people really really don't want to tell you that their pet ate pot. We don't give a crap if you smoke it and we're not reporting you, but we need to know what your pet ate. I'm an emergency medicine physician. I had an elderly gentleman come in because he fell in his kitchen. Didn't lose consciousness or anything. Didn't have any signs of trauma. But both eyes were slightly swollen which he said happened before the fall. Oh and he forgot to tell me. He also had a sore throat. He wouldn't have even brought it up if I hadn't asked why his voice sounded a little muffled. 
took a close look at his throat. He had some pretty significant pharyngeal edema. He ended up having what's called angioedema which explains the throat and eye swelling different from an allergic reaction. He ended up getting intubated and sedated, and went to the IQ to protect his airway. He initially came in because of a completely inconsequential fall, and got intubated and admitted to the IQ because of an oh by the way doc moment. As a primary care doctor we try to keep to our tight schedules. It can be difficult when patients could come in with something complex or with a shopping list of things they want to talk about and balancing this with providing good care and being mindful that the next patient will be waiting in 15 minutes for their appointment. We can be notorious for being late for these reasons. I saw a patient the other day who said she had a runny nose. I just got on with it, made sure she didn't have any signs of a more serious illness and gave her some advice on what to do. After that she also had a pain in her ankle she quickly wanted checked out. I couldn't find much wrong and assured her it would probably be okay in a couple of days. Now her 15 minutes is up and I'm kinda gesturing her that we are finished. Then she pauses and says okay I just wanted to get those things checked out. The main reason I'm here is that I've been having chest pain all morning. God I facepalmed. To the doctors of Reddit, what is it like when you have a doctor's appointment? I avoid disclosing I'm a doctor unless specifically asked what I do for work. I think I'm better taken care of when the doc team is most comfortable and working in their routine. A difficult and demanding patients who request special treatment often have worse outcomes. I don't want to be one of them. I completely agree. I never tell them I am a doctor. Same thing when I take my kids to a pediatrician. I just want to be treated like a regular patient. Only exception was when I broke my hand and needed it operated on ASAP. Not 10 days later. Went to student health as a med student. Attending I worked with the week before does my pap. With a resident. He asked. I said yes. Kept quizzing me what am I looking for? What does it mean if the pap is positive? Etc. I am getting questions right but he's being real weird about it. Realize in parking lot after apt he was asking the resident not me. Rotate with said resident a few months later. Freaking fantastic. With my mom. It was like this. Mom. I think I have basal cell carcinoma on my back but I can't see it quite clearly. Dumb. You do have basal cell carcinoma. Good job. My mom drove herself to the ER and said pretty sure I have appendicitis. She's a doctor but to be fair, it's got some obvious signs. And they doubted her because she didn't look like she was in enough pain. Turns out it was about to rupture. Being in a resident, I always wonder which one of my co-residents is working in the emergency department as I drive home from a shift. Knowing if something were to happen, they would be checking my rectal tone in front of all my co-workers. And then I think about how big their hands are. Male gynecologist here. When I have a patient come in for a pap it is always a bit annoying when they leave their underwear on under the gown. I have to step out of the room and wait for them to remove it. When I went in for my first physical in years I stripped naked under the paper gown. Apparently guys don't do this. They leave their underwear on. Who knew? My family doc, who is also my best friend, had a good laugh at my expense over this breach in etiquette. He also texted me the night before to let me know he was putting the KY in the fridge for my exam. I'm always a little annoyed when I get to an appointment and I'm not explicitly told which layers they expect me to undress to. Not everyone knows. It truly depends on the way you act. Most of the time I won't tell the doctor that I'm also a doctor unless specifically asked about it or if there is a slip of my tongue about symptoms or any other medical words. Some doctors tend to be not too specific when they know you are a doctor because you already know what's happening sometimes even my wife gets the ask your husband to clarify your questions. I try to have an open mind when I'm the patient because we are trained to think the worst, so there is a lot of cancer in my mind. Currently I work in a palliative care unit, I have had medical patients and carers, and I would say that it is truly diverse how they react, we are also human and we are sick and vulnerable the doctor vein can go completely off or go on overdrive, turning it off is better and less intrusive most of the time. There is a lot of cancer in my mind, you should probably have that checked out by a doctor, I hear cancer is bad for you. Whenever my dad, who is a doctor, took me in for an appointment when I was a kid. It was always super awkward because if anything was done even remotely incorrectly he'd basically do the medical equivalent of the let me speak to your manager routine. Which, I kind of understand in that context. 
Since it's your kid's health you're talking about and not a freaking expired coupon. But still. Made me want to melt through the floor. 9-9. In my experience, doctors tend to be pretty decent patients when admitted to the hospital. They know the routine. They get to know the nurses they try not to hassle anyone. They can speak to their own doctors as colleagues etc. Nurses, on the other hand, feel it is very important for you to know, at all times and in every sentence, that they are nurses and they are much better at nursing than you. I will say there was this one instance of a doctor patient and a hospitalist getting into an argument that was pretty interesting. Basically, doctor patient disagreed with what the hospitalist was doing and asked if hospitalist had read any of the recent studies which suggested that he, instead, follow a different protocol. Hospitalist was not down with the let's talk as colleagues and decided to go full on frick you. I'm the only one wearing pants in the room right now. There was a mild argument but it remained incredibly civil. Two days later the hospitalist was fired. Doctor patient's brother, or some other close relation, was the CEO. Nurses tend to thrash. Doctors go for surgically precise cuts. I mean, it makes me wonder how often he was actually listening to his patients. If he wouldn't listen to a fellow doctor, your average person doesn't have the knowledge to advocate for themselves. And this guy shut down a medical professional who was doing just that. Med student. Had to go to the ED and then surgery for appendicitis. Got pimped by the surgeon. Felt bad man. Not a doctor, but as the husband of a nurse, it's horrid. My wife and the doctor nurse practitioner will sit and bat ideas back and forth until they can get my wife to accept the diagnosis as her own idea. Nurses are the worst patients. I had to actively tell myself to shut up multiple times when I broke a bone last year and just politely accept or deny the care they offered, because I didn't want to become the stereotype. I'm a doctor. We make terrible patients because we tend to minimize or rationalize every warning sign. Going for a doctor's appointment basically reminds us that we can also get sick, and since we have a burden of knowledge we're just hoping we don't find something that'll force a lifestyle change. Otherwise, most times it's been a pretty standard experience in terms of registering, waiting, 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 and being seen for 15 minutes. If you go to someone you know personally, which I actually recommend against, you might get some preferential treatment, but it's mostly the same. Other way around. I'm a nurse and was taking care of a doctor I work with. Ork. She asked me if she should give a urine sample and she wasn't in for something I'd usually get one for but then she made me nervous cause she should know that. So I was you're the doctor you tell me and she said nope you're the one calling the shots now and I was like okay well think we are good without one then. It was pretty awkward all around. But I work labor and delivery so we deliver a lot of our own nurses and doctors which is strange but also nice. My grandpa used to teach anatomy in med school and his students got my grandma when she was in labor. She says she got the best care ever because they were terrified of having their professor's wife. Today I learned that doctors go see other doctors. I thought they healed themselves naturally, like glowy mist thingies oozing out of their bodies and raising up into the air. But I have heard of barbers going to other barbers. But I have heard of barbers going to other barbers. If there is only two barbers in town go to the one with the worst haircut. My PCP doesn't know I'm a physician. When he asked, I lied about my profession. Pretty great really. Front of the line type stuff. Call my PCP friends or partner and say, Hey what are you doing for lunch? I've got a thing on me I want your opinion on. I'll buy you lunch. Or a radiologist. Hey man, my shoulder's been killing me. I lifted too much with it and now it's balked. Mind doing an MRI sure. What's lunch look like for you? Basically I end up buying people lunches and they don't have to document anything. Win win. My dad is a pharmacist and the number of times I'd come out of an appointment with a certain prescription and he would call the doctor to tell them to change it is countless. Most of the time he was colleagues or had a one degree of separation kind of relationship with these doctors so they didn't seem to mind even though it was awkward for me personally. Typically he knew of a better option or just wanted the generic which would save him a bunch of money. I had one eye doctor who was pee though. So that was not fun. Drugs can be expensive as frick. So I don't blame him. A doctors and nurses. Have any of your patients surprised you with their amount? Or lack of pain tolerance? A friend told me an old boy came in with a large laceration on his arm. Suturing it up took over an hour. But can be quite fun as you can chat to the patients. 
my friend was engrossed talking to him about his experiences in the second world war and really enjoyed treating him. The old chap was in good spirits throughout and told him lots of interesting stories about his time behind enemy lines or in trenches in Flanders. After he put the last stitch in, my friend started clearing up and found the local anesthetic bottle, and opened. He realized he'd not put any local in at all and yet the guy didn't once flinch leave aside complain. When asked why he didn't say anything, he just said oh I thought that's how it's supposed to feel, I didn't mind, lovely chatting to you, then walked out. Don't make them how they used to. You gotta watch those old guys. Anybody of the generation that fought in Korea or World War 2 will get up and walk on two broken ankles for a chest x-ray. Tough guys. A doctor here. My intern year in residency, I saw a 17 year old kid who, when while playing hockey, tried to stop a puck with a gloved hand. It struck his fingertip, injuring the base of his nail causing a significant deformity. His nail bed needed repair, which requires first removing the nail. That is done by bluntly separating the nail from the tissue below it. If your stomach didn't turn reading that and imagining it, congratulations, you have no soul. Typically, we use a numbing agent to eliminate sensation to the entire finger using something called a digital block. I put it in. After 10 minutes, he still felt me touching his fingertip. I tried putting some around the nail. He still felt everything. His mother said his father actually had a similar thing. Lidocaine didn't work on him. I offered him a different numbing medicine. We can inject Benadryl in that cas. Or even knocking him out. He looked at me in the eyes and said doc. Just take it off. Without anything yeah. It's fine. They fix our cuts without numbing medicine. But it's gonna hurt a lot. I have to scrape. I know. So I went at it. He grabbed a towel with his other hand and I went to work. 45 minutes later, the nail was off, he was repaired, and I replaced the nail in its rightful place. The kid didn't even make a noise. Holy frick, I'm ready to puke just reading that. Oh my god. Fire medic here. Farmers seem to be tough. One time a guy pulled into the front ramp, got out of his truck and walked up holding his severed forearm in his other arm. Get him in the truck, take off. Along the way he states he lived down the road and wanted to get to us quickly. When asked why he didn't call 9, 1, 1, he replied I just cut my arm. I ain't dying. Also had a battle of the bulge vet tell me he didn't need a blanket. It was minus 7 with windchill. A doc. 50 year old guy with a massive heart attack just lying there chillin. Ask him his pain level. Deadpan. Just a little. 5 year old boy with both forearm bones fractured and dislocated, playing on iPad with other arm. 60 year old lady's lips, falls, destroys pelvic bone, just wants one turn and all end, scooches out of bed wanting to walk home. After much convincing, she begrudgingly accepted that might not be a great idea. There are some badass people out there. EMT here, I once took a kid, about 18, 19. To the ear screaming all the way. For sunburn. Sunburn. I mean, yeah, sunburn isn't fun. But this kid was claiming 9 stroke 10 pain and whimpering. I was astounded. Charge nurse and I giggled about it for weeks. I was a tech in the ear when the EMTs brought in an elderly woman with what they said was a sprained ankle. She had slipped while mopping a floor at work and her co-worker had called it in. Turned out she had broken both of the bones in the lower part of her leg but was sweetly chatting with us. I was impressed as soon as I saw those rays. EMTs had no idea and had splintered her ankle over where her bones were broken. Typically, broken bones in the legs, unless there's a huge amount of angulation displacement, do not cause a ton of pain, unless moved. We see that often in the old people with hip fractures as well. They're usually sitting there still and having no pain, but the second you try to move it, they're in excruciating pain. Same goes with trying to bear weight. My goddaughter was born very prematurely, requiring a major open heart surgery at 2 weeks old. We were told by her docs that since she'd gone through so much surgical trauma the first few weeks of her life, as a neonate, her pain receptors nerve endings would not develop normally. They gave us the example that if she put her hand on a hot stove as a kid, she would have sustained a severe burn before feeling any pain whatsoever. She never cried as a kid when she got shots fell down banged into things. Even when it was enough to draw blood, I suspect her medical history was the cause. 
Working in a hospital has taught me the downside of abusing painkillers drugs patients constantly come in here with long term substance abuse issues and now that they are actually hurt, MVC, broke bones, etc. You can give them enough drugs to put down a horse and they still feel everything. I had a patient with an open tib fib fracture, the bones in the lower leg sticking out and below that it looks like jelly, trying to walk away apparently unaware of how bad his leg was. Of course he was incredibly drunk at the time. Well, it's a good thing you aren't a terrible medic. Wait. Radiographer here. As a student I met a patient who was a typical little old lady. She came in with far too many shopping bags and walked extremely slowly. She'd been sent by her GP because she'd fallen getting out of the bath a few weeks previous. So we brought her in and took the first image. AP pelvis if you were wondering. And her pelvis was absolutely ruined. Turns out she had slipped and fallen with one leg in and one leg out of the bath and taken the whole fall on her. Vagina. Not wanting to cause a fuss this woman had ignored the pain and carried on her life as normal for weeks. Long enough for the fractures to be fairly healed, albeit in a strange way not really resembling a pelvis much anymore. Not a, but actually a cashier at a fast food place. A woman ordered two meals, and since she was a little older, really old actually, I offered to bring her food to the table so she wouldn't have to wait. I get there, and her husband had wads of paper towels stuck all over his arms with electrical tape, and his right hand and part of his face were a mix of blood and second degree burns. Turned out he was working on his lawn mower, and the engine blew up on him. They stopped for lunch on the way to the hospital for burns, and the metal they couldn't get out. He was acting like it was nothing. I was chatting with my physiotherapist one day about pain tolerance and she said that she once had a, ex maybe, cocaine addict as a patient whose tolerance was absolute zero. She couldn't even touch him without him perceiving it as painful, let alone stretch or manipulate his body. She said he was a very challenging case. Working as an EMT, I got called to a, 64 year old female, slipped in her house possible sprained ankle. When we got there, the woman is sitting in a chair with her legs stretched out in front of her, but she had long pants and slippers on that covered the entire ankle so I couldn't really see it. When we walked in, she was talking and didn't really seem to be in any pain at all, so I figured this was going to be an easy trip. I kneeled down in front of her to take a closer look, and wasn't I surprised to find that it wasn't just broken, it was fricked right up. I mean, the foot was at a 90 degree angle to the outside, and it was also leaned down so what should have been the side of her foot was facing straight down, and the bone that should have been holding the ankle in place was pushing against the skin on the inside of her ankle so hard that it was about to rip through. I was bewildered at the fact that at that moment she said, it doesn't hurt, so I hope it isn't broken. She hardly made a peep on the ride to the hospital, 35 miles, very bumpy. Come to find out she had multiple sclerosis and that makes people feel pain differently. A doctor here. I can't count on two hands the number of patients I have seen that are covered in tattoos and are scared of needles IVs. I mean, complete phobia. It makes absolutely no sense. If anyone can enlighten me as to how this phenomenon can exist, I'd appreciate it. To quote a friend of a friend. When asked by an adoc who queried why he was freaking out over getting a tetanus shot after having a cut sewn up without anesthetic, that's why it's called an irrational fear of needles. Working at a racing track, I had both of these people come in on the same day. Male, 54 years, Swedish, small cut on hand. His reaction to me pouring water, saline, in his wound. OWOWOWOWOWOW, it hurts when you put disinfectant in there, be careful. Male, 32 years, finish, deep cut in right forearm, his humeral bone was visible. No, it doesn't hurt, now just tape it the frick up so I can get back on my bike. As a Swedish person, I tell you this, do not frick with the Finnish people. I've had a few patients in Tridge swear that their pain was 10 stroke 10 while eating. Drinking, laughing, playing on cell phone, I'll charge whatever number that they said and then put in the notes, patient laughing, insert verb or emotion, I had one nurse that when a patient would say a certain number, she'd hand them a card that would say, at a pain level of 7 you would be sweating, vital signs would be elevated, you would be nauseated and probably vomiting, then she'd ask, 
You sure your 7 9 stroke 10 will change their answers? My dad has an unusually high pain tolerance. He was cleaning a fishing pole in our backyard once when he didn't notice that the pole had splintered and pulled his hand down on it. The force caused the pole to snap in half and drive itself all the way through his hand. He stood up, walked in the kitchen with pole hanging out of his hand and calmly asked my mom if he should just pull it out or go to the air. Since it was a fiberglass one, he opted for the ER, just in case something was broken off inside his hand. The list goes on and on and gets worse. The other was when he fell off a ladder and shattered his leg. The bone came through the skin and he was bitchy about going to the air. I'm a nurse who used to work in orthopedics. The amount of people who would guzzle oral morphine was unbelievable. Older adults, s little old ladies, would just take two paracetamol and would be totally fine. I went to the air with my younger brother after a ski accident. My brother fell on his back off quite a big drop, causing his sternum split open. A few runs later he said he was sure something was wrong with his chest so we eventually got to the air. The doctor was shocked that he was able to continue skiing after it, and that he wasn't writhing in pain when it was touched. My brother's explanation was yeah it hurts, but I can't do anything about it. 5 year old child with a severed finger, half hanging off, cool as a cucumber and not even upset, mum was in hysterics. I have a similar story involving a 21 year old female. Severed her index finger in a door and I was the first responder. I controlled the bleeding until we could get her to a hospital but she took it like a champ. I didn't hear a single peep out of her mouth. Med seekers and junkies coming down have the same level of pain tolerance. Barely touch the junkies and they flip out due to pain. Whereas the med seekers attempt that crap and overact. I saw the guy try to fake a seizure and it was the funniest crap ever. He was curling his hands up like he had CP and leaning his head back to gather spit so he could foam at the mouth. Med seekers will always be allergic to morphine and need dilaudid and ativan. I don't think I have met anyone with a high pain tolerance. Some chick came in with cysts on her ovaries and declined meds because she was in recovery. So that is actually pretty badass. Nurse here. While in school, I had a 7 year old girl who had broke her hip by getting bounced off a trampoline. They lived a few hours out of town and when it happened, they knew she was hurt, but not how bad. So her parents put her in the back of the truck and hauled her, for 45 plus minutes to their local hospital. She got there, they did x-rays and found it was YI too bad for them to treat and that she needed to come to us. They rushed the family out, without anything for pain for this little one. For another hour plus ride to our this girl didn't shed a tear. She was hands down the toughest patient I've ever had. I had a 19 year old do the same while skateboarding and I had to pull him out of the car while another nurse held his leg in place. Some people will amaze you with their strength and braveness. When I was studying nursing I saw a man who had broken his knee in a motorcycle accident 3 days before. The knee was at least 3 times its normal size. The doctor asked him about the pain and he told him it wasn't that bad. He was mostly annoyed at his family who had taken him to the emergency room. My grandmother wouldn't take pain medicine, not sure why, but even getting dental work done, she didn't want numbing agents. The only time I know that she took pain meds was some aspirin after getting t-boned while driving and hurting her shoulder. She passed away last year from ALS a few weeks before her 80th birthday. She was the most independent person I've ever known and even having to rely on her kids for help. She didn't complain. Patients in a sickle cell crisis. I've pushed up to 14 milligrams of dilaudid, 1-2 milligrams at a time, into these patients without a resulting change in vital signs or mentation. However, I've also seen young men competing in rodeos who have been stomped by a bull a few times come in with broken ribs and a pneumothorax saying, it's just a scratch and declining pain medications. He had an older marine that came in, reason being stiff neck and nausea, does his normal workup, rules out c-spine injury, decides to test for meningitis, tells the guy to touch his chin to his chest, turn left, turn right, look up, nothing, tells the guy to stand on his toes, and drop onto his heels, and the guy nearly collapses and then vomits on the floor, doc asks, didn't it hurt when you touched your chin to your chest, marine replies, Yes it freaking hurt, but what does that have to do with it? I'm your doctor, you're supposed to tell me when something is wrong. The marine just looked at him with a slightly blank look on his face, 
and said, Oh, sorry doc, won't happen again. I'm an oncology nurse. My patients have some of the highest pain tolerances I have ever seen. They literally have tumors taking over entire cavities in their bodies. Huge masses pressing on places that aren't supposed to be pressed on and literally eroding through their skin and they will ask me for pain meds when I have a second. It amazes me. You've been visited by the happiest doggo in the world. He wants to share his happiness but only if you let him know. Type I love you happy papa to get some of his happiness. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.